All right, welcome everyone. Um, this is the Access, Inclusivity, and Equity in the Virtual Science Classroom panel discussion. This hour, we have a really great conversation um, and one that's been happening, I think, in many of our personal conversations as well. We'll be talking about access, inclusivity, and equity in the virtual science classroom and education at large. Although we aim to make science as objective and unbiased as possible, Scientists are human and humans are inherently biased. In addition, most undergraduate courses are hard pressed to simply cover the content. Um, not that they don't typically address issues of access, inclusivity and equity. We just need to bring this to the forefront. Students with differences, including disabilities add to the rich diversity of our schools. And during the pandemic, remote teaching has highlighted the need to create websites, digital course content, and online teaching tools that are inclusive and accessible to all users. Some questions we'll be looking at today include how can science instructors leverage technology to help remove the physical, technological, and attitudinal barriers to access, opportunity, and choice enjoyed by majority of students? And what opportunities do we have to tell the stories of scientists of color, women, and non-binary genders in 2020, a year categorized by both a social justice awakening and remote learning, of course, due to the pandemic. Contributing to this conversation, we'll hear from four panelists. We have Dr. Laura Rosie, operations and lab technician and online lecturer of biology from the University of Kansas. Dr. Mark Mort, Professor of Biology and Co-Chair of the Undergraduate Biology Program at the University of Kansas. Dr. Sophia Raming, Associate Director of the Center for the Advancement of Teaching at Florida State University. And Francesca Raming, Upper Level Technology, Upper, sorry, Upper Level Laboratory Technician for Biology at the University of the Bah Bahamas. So want to open it up now to the group um, again, we'll go through a panel discussion and then save some time for Q&A at the end. So I want to kind of kick this off um, and I'm going to ask Laura the first question. You developed a fully online non-majors biology lab course um, over the course of last year, even before the pandemic happened. Um, tell us a little bit about how you had accessibility in mind in developing this and what opportunities has this allowed for your students? Okay, so as you said, we developed this course um, before COVID, before the pandemic. Um, we were challenged with developing a fully online biology lab class. So when we just set out to design the class, we wanted it to be inclusive and resilient. Um, we've used the lobster simulations and we have created our at-home lab activities. Our at-home lab experiments um, were designed to build on the concepts and the content that was um, presented in the lobster simulations. Um, these at-home assignments require students to collect data, share data as a class, and they work together um, for data analysis and to generate conclusions. Um, our assignments can be completed anywhere. That was one of the things that we wanted to build into this as well was flexibility for all students. Um, the students do not need to purchase lab equipment or supplies with the exception of maybe a small bag of candy. Um, let's see, the, if you want to, the students can complete the simulations multiple times. They can complete the lab assignment, repeat the experiment. So those are the things that we looked at when we built the course content. Um, so what some of the things that we found is that our students that we have in our class are single moms, working students that work full time, um, students that live at home. So we have pretty much hit all kinds of students. <laughs> so really reaching a large number of students and how many students are currently taking this course? Um, our class is an eight week course and every eight weeks we have about 300 students at a time. Amazing. So not only is it that many students, but it's accelerated too. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> getting through what would typically be, let's say 16 weeks and eight weeks is, is no small feat. Um, right. And I know that, like you were saying, something that students can access 
from anywhere on their own time um, is, is really powerful. And again, this was all developed before the pandemic when you didn't know this would have to be the case anyway. So you were right. luckily at the forefront of it. Um, and Mark, I know you're involved in this course as well. Um, tell us a little bit, I mean, we planned or you planned for this course to reach all of these students and allow them to take it. Have you seen the enrollments and the types of students that you expected to see or what have been the results of that? Yeah, it's been actually really interesting and it's kind of a, a work in progress. We're, we're kind of tracking who is signing up for this course, but um, we maintained everybody we thought we would retain, um, which are a lot of nursing students, uh, pre-health, exercise science. That, that's the, the biggest clientele for our, uh, for our non-majors lab. Um, the thing that's been really interesting is we have had a lot of people contact us, a lot meaning like you know over 20, uh, this semester alone, who contacted me and said, um, I've always been interested in biology lab, but I've never been able to take it because I don't have the time to come into a physical laboratory setting. Um, and other options that have been out there, as Laura uh, spoke to, um, a lot of times there are expenses associated with you have to buy an at-home lab kit, um, things like that. And so I think Laura and I, whenever we were thinking about designing this lab, we're very deliberate in saying, if we're going to do this, we want this lab to be accessible to anybody anywhere in the world. And so it doesn't matter if you're in Lawrence, Kansas or, or Boston, where you are, Hannah, or if you're in Southeast Asia, you can find a parking lot. We literally have ecological experiments where they're collecting data based on just surveying cars in a parking lot. Or you can find a bag of, we use gummy bears, but you can use whatever candy you want to look at ecological sampling strategies and to look at um, various other um, sort of concepts within biology. And so uh, the pressing need pre-COVID was that we had a number of degree programs that were trying to move fully online. Um, as Laura came online and we started thinking about like this course, we thought this is actually a better experience across the board for everybody. So let's just take the whole thing online uh, so moving forward, we are not going to have in-person non-majors biology labs uh, again. Like we, we feel like that what we've been doing is accessible, uh, it's engaging, and the feedback from students has been uh, uniformly very positive. Um, and so, so I think that speaks to your question, Hannah. We, we kept everybody we thought we would keep, and we have expanded greatly to people who have an interest in biology and just never have been able to physically make it to uh, campus to take the course. That's amazing. I love that expanding your reach, giving students new opportunities to explore something that they might not have thought they could explore. Again, this is um, a non-majors course. So I, I mean, looking back on my college experience, that sounds pretty accessible. If it's something I could do, I think a lot of people could do it and enjoy it. Um, and I love, I love the, the gummy bear activity as well. That sounds yeah. really fun. Um, and tasty. Uh, that, that's my favorite too, but I happen to, I happen to love gummy bears. So <laughs> love it. Amazing. So of course, keeping in mind these different, different types of students. Um, and I know that something as well that Labster worked on specifically with the University of Kansas is, you know, accessibility from the standpoint of allowing the content to be accessible to students with different physical disabilities. Um, not sure now that the course is live and running, and we've, we've seen the boom in enrollments. Have you seen any, any benefits from that? Any stories from students um, or just overall impacts? Um, yeah, I actually have a very uh, story that I'd like to share. So um, in one of the sections, I had a student um, without arms. And one of the things, or the comment that came back from the student was that this class was accessible. They could complete the lab -stir simulations, they could complete the experiments, the at-home experiments on their own. They, they accomplished them by themselves without having to have the aid of other people helping them. And so I think that that gave her a great sense of accomplishment and pride that and ability to take this course. That's amazing. Uh, Mark, have you heard anything or is that the I think that's probably the most, in, I think that's probably the most impactful story yeah. we've gotten from students. But again, we are hearing um, students in wheelchairs have reached out and said, like, I always was concerned about trying to take a biology lab because I didn't know if I would be able to move around the lab room. 
Um, and so I think <clears throat> with Laura's story, that story, as well as um, just being able to work with you and your team to get screen reader technology up to speed and to check those kinds of boxes that we have for students who have specific needs um, has been very productive. And I think that we, um, we feel moving forward that we'll only be able to work more with you all to make it even more accessible. So um, Great. We, we're, we're pretty happy where things are at right now. That's fantastic to hear. Um, and I would love to open the conversation to Sophia and Fran. Curious if you have seen, I know with, with moving so much virtual the past six, seven, eight months, um, have you seen kind of, I guess, breakdowns in what's available with resources in regards to providing equal access um, to students with disabilities? And you are both on mute if you are <laughs> saying anything. I, I fixed it. Um, <laughs> at my university, I can only attest to the biochemistry department for which I work. Mm -hmm. um, currently, there are not any students with disabilities. However, Labster has closed a gap, which would have been wide open due to the pandemic. So I can, I can speak to that. Absolutely. We are in isolation in the country due to government government stipulation, so we have quarantine, and students cannot access labs, in-person labs. This is actually an image of the lab that I run at the University of the Bahamas. So Labster's platform has kind of allowed us to continue with classes, particularly biochemistry and nursing classes where that would not have been a possibility without it. Um, but as far as disabled students are concerned in my major set, I have not encountered any students with physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. at this so I really, I really can't speak to that. So I would pass that on to Dr. Rami. Um, Fran, I think one thing I do wanna share with our audience is that you have used, you have the unique experience of using lab simulations both as a student, I believe, and as a lab technician with your own students now. Um, can you shed a little bit um, of light on that experience and just the different impacts you've seen in both of those two roles? Okay, as a student, I was introduced to Labster while taking immunology class. And as it stands, my university still lacks much of the equipment needed to perform um, an in-depth laboratory uh, simulation in person. Mm -hmm. So fill that gap, my lecturer, who was a new lecturer at the time, Dr. L. Russell, he introduced Labster to us and we could then take part in all types of laboratory activities with reference to immunology and I just loved it. I love that it was so in-depth in regard to the theory, you can really get a full grasp on the content and what it means to relate all lab activities to the theory. I love the diagrams, the explanation of functions. I am totally smitten by it all. And as a student, I was so taken by it that I had to speak with Dr. Ramming, who is actually my mother, about it. And I told her, I said, I really enjoy this. It's stimulating, it's, I'm engaged by it, I'm not bored. Sometimes our lab sessions can go on for multiple hours and students can lose interest in the task. But however, the labs of simulations are not very long. It generally takes a student about an hour to complete. And then you read, you read the theory beforehand, but I find that the theory is the, the way that they, they, the dialogue is very, they use vernacular related to um, bio. So I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the fact that all the labeling is there. The diagrams are all in different colors. That's something that we would not um, find in a lab class. Um, sheets are often given, but they're in black and white and it's very boring. <laughs> very boring. And I, I really do appreciate using Labster as a student. Um, so I was glad when the pandemic happened and I realized that we can continue lab classes and there would be no halt in any academic activities. My students 
actually are excited to come to class. Beforehand, in-person lab attendance kind of diminishes as the semester progresses. However, we've seen uh, engagement in all the simulations. They complete them on time. If they have any questions, they are free to message me, which they usually do. And as a lab technician now, my role is to answer any questions that they have for clarity based on the theory, or if they find a, a question more difficult, we will walk through it and then have them complete the assignment um, from there. So my role is pretty, it's pretty the same, but I, I speak with them directly um, after the simulation is, is done, but usually I kind of give them a little hint um, I like to complete the simulation beforehand just because it's fun for me and right. it makes me feel very close to them that we're all doing this together as a group. And um, I will post, there's a group, there's a university group in which all the students are involved and I will make little posts in that group um, that speaks to the theory and particular areas I would like them to focus on as well as key questions, I believe, may come up in a future quiz. So I give them a little hint there and they look forward to that. They always comment underneath that post and they, they look forward to it every Sunday or Monday. So that is the role that I play currently. I love that. I love that, like you said, you're, you're using the technology with the students, knowing the experience that they were going through, especially when this is the first time a lot of students are using something like lab simulations, but I know for everyone, you know, listening right now, you might be using other technology, other online homework systems or different types of questioning, polling systems. Um, so it's, it's a time for us all to get familiar with, with what's out there. And something, I'm not sure, Dr. Raming, if, if your audio is, is working. I'm gonna try, can you hear me? <laughs> well, yes, and I know, great. So something that, that Fran touched on, which I know you're quite passionate about is she had said that one of the big draws to using a lab simulation is that it, it would provide virtual access to equipment that the lab does not have in person. Um, speak a little bit more about your, what your experience is with this and kind of what, what draws your passion there. Thank you. So I'm going to start from my current situation and why it drives that kind of passion. I am at Florida State University, which is an R1 institution known for its research, known for its resources, and the pandemic came, right? And we had to quickly move from face-to-face -to, -face to remote. And I hear in the back of my head, Ms. Raming saying to me, you know, mom, I'm really engaged with this platform as a student. And I go like, oh, we need something because I'm sitting on a committee that's thinking about how can we provide students with the resources so that they don't fall off map, right? It's time to degree, it's cost of education. Every extra semester costs a ton of money. And so we think about it and I just keep remembering what she said to me and you know, I contact you guys, you were fantastic. We worked towards a proposal. And in a short period of time, you gave access to a number of the faculty on campus and they used it, right? Okay, it's working well, we can do this thing with our students. And then fall comes and we have negotiated to have broad universal access for our students. So within a couple of weeks, um, unlike my fellow colleagues who have a few hundred, we moved to thousands of students. About 3,200 students within the first two weeks were up and running on the platform. And then we added our other campuses. So our engineering campus, our campus in Panama City, our campus in Italy, all of these uh, campuses were able to offer science labs in a beat, right? Not dropping anything, students carrying on, and faculty aligning those labs with their course objectives. And it occurred to me, wow, this is something that Francesca and I talked about briefly. What if we had this same kind of access for students who are interested in science in the global south, right? You can't necessarily build the kind of lab that's in Lobster in developing countries. You have multiple concerns, healthcare, basic education, and you would have to think, do I want to spend millions of dollars 
to do this when I have this pressing need. Here is this platform that can provide for students um, a way to get the science, the theory, whether they have a science instructor or not, because the theory is presented so well. They can do the simulations, right? They have access to world-class equipment that they would never be able to have given their current situation. And then they get that learning, that excitement about STEM, about science, because everywhere in the world has a problem that needs to be solved by science. And it's great when you can solve it for your own community, for yourself, when there's not a savior coming in to say, do this, do that. I know, as we would say in my home, how my shoe fits, right? I know what it means to have hurricanes coming in. I know what it means to have to solve health issues. So my passion is how quickly can we provide science for all through these kinds of platforms, right? Could we move this into the Caribbean on a grand scale? Could we move it into South America? Could we move it into Africa? And then what world problems could we solve if we had science for all? Um, if our understanding of science was equitable, right? Not that some people understand why this happens and some are left with myth, though myth is wonderful. I'm certainly a person of faith, but there are some things that we know this works like this. And so working in an R1, I get and start to understand those disparities, like the students who have both the possibility of in-person fantastic labs and have the resources because we have a wonderful and understanding chief academic officer in Dr. Sally McCrory, who wants students to continue their education despite what's happening with the pandemic, who's willing to support this kind of initiative on campus to say, we are going to provide science for our students no matter what's happening with COVID-19. So that's my passion. I study women in STEM, international women in STEM, and I see it as an avenue for women everywhere men too, non-binary, everybody, but my particular focus is women, right? For women everywhere to learn about science multiple times, practice, and then solve the issues of their communities. So I'm very excited about this collaboration that we have going on. Um, we have multiple Labster platforms that are happening at Florida State, luckily. And I look forward to what comes out of that, like both for your company and for our, for our institution. Absolutely. I mean, it is an amazing partnership and I love the big vision that you have. I think that's something that I have personally. I know, I know Labster does as a whole. And I think as educators, you know, I'm sure everyone on the phone agrees. We want to empower our students to make a difference in their lives, their communities and the world ultimately, you know, in the future. Um, and it is really a, a, a powerful sentiment, but it is achievable. It is doable. It just takes some innovation and collaboration along the way, which is really what we're trying to do today. Um, so thank you for those thoughts. And I would love to kind of open that up now to everyone on the panel, whoever wants to jump in. Um, and, you know, Sophia, you brought up that idea of, you know, your focus is women in STEM. And I would love to hear just since, you know, we're, you're all from different institutions, um, what improvements have you seen to make science education and in particular virtual science education more inclusive for all? And what improvements, you know, do we have still on the line to, to achieve? As far as improvements are concerned, especially as it relates to Labster, much of my student population um, do, do not have access to laptops or computers at the moment due to the pandemic and quarantine stipulations by the government. We are all not allowed to attend the university or attend any public libraries. I am looking forward to Labster being made available on devices such as Android devices, mm -hmm. iOS devices, tablets, those are things that students already have access to. And I think it may be a lot uh, less expensive to obtain versus a simple tablet or uh, Samsung device. And I think once that occurs, uh, more students will be able to take part in the lab simulations and perform them 
more readily um, while they're on the go. And I'm looking forward to that happening. As far as representation at my university, females do account for most of the STEM population. However, males, I have observed that males are um, beginning to flow into that area. And I'm very pleased about that, particularly those under the age of 20. Um, we see more engagement and more participation of males in the STEM area uh, at the University of the Bahamas, where beforehand, most of my class uh, were represented by females. And we had a running joke that biochemistry was kind of an all girls uh, medium, kind of an all girls uh, degree. And now um, I'm competing, at least I'm graduate now, but now there are four males in my class, in my graduating class that I had to compete with. And I'm like, oh, this is new. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested and I really, I can appreciate um, the push for black males to enter the field of STEM and then black professionals to enter the STEAM, the, the field of STEM worldwide. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, it's, it's interesting to hear that, that shift. Um, Laura and Mark, how does that compare with the, the students you're seeing in your courses and in the overall biology program at University of Kansas? I was gonna yield to Laura, but okay, I will. Okay, um, so in, our, in the biology class that we have as non-majors, um, I think we have a pretty even mix um, between boys and girls because we have a lot of sports management um, and exercise science students. And um, that tends to be where you find the boys. Um, so I just know that like by being, by having the science or having labs that are available to all students. And um, I think because it's a simulation platform, you don't feel the, you maybe don't feel hesitant about going into a lab um, or if you weren't sure if you wanted to take a lab class, this is a great way to be introduced to science or introduced to the types of things that go on in a lab without feeling that pressure that, oh, maybe I'll make a mistake or I won't be able to do it because the way the lobster simulations are presented, if you make a mistake, you can do it again and it's all right. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Um, and I'd be curious too to hear with your course at the scale it's it's currently taught. Um, you know, there was a great point brought up earlier about what do we want to see in virtual science education? What improvements can we make? And one of them is absolutely just access to technology, right? Um, kind of touching on Salcon's keynote earlier. Um, you know, there's a lot of improvements to be made, and I'd be curious, and I'm sure a lot of people listening are curious. What are you doing for students that do not have access to, say, a laptop or high-speed internet at, at home? I know I, I hear this from people all over the country, and I know my colleagues do as well. How are, are you currently addressing some of those some of those issues? So the University of Kansas put together a program that's offered through our IT department. Um, so it is loaner equipment for students that need a laptop or need a hotspot um, for mobile internet access. And so it, if we have a student that says, oh, I don't have stable internet connection or something like that, we refer them to the IT department and there's just an application form and they hope they get them situated. That's amazing. So again, yeah, we, creating I, equity. I Mark, can jump ahead. in on that. Sorry, I can go jump ahead. in on that too. I mean, we have we have shipped um, hotspots around the globe. Um, you know, there's, I have one because I've got two kids who are doing remote learning and a wife who's teaching and I'm teaching. And so our internet is always like right at the verge of collapse. And so um, they have been incredibly generous with getting students, uh, as Laura mentioned, loaner laptops, um, hotspots, and, um, and it's all based on the, the honor system. At some point, whenever we're post-COVID, you'll send those things back. Um, and so I think that's been, that's been really good. Uh, to, to one of the other questions you had, Hannah, um, I think one of the things that we have been doing uh, I certainly have been involved in this for about the past eight years or so, is really trying to look at what methods and techniques are impactful for retention of students 
uh, in various majors. I've been focusing, focusing primarily on STEM majors, but we also are thinking a lot about our, um, our non-STEM students and how to engage them. And many of the things that Laura uh, developed, I kind of gave her the charges like, um, you know, they're not, we, we're not trying to convert students to be STEM majors. It'd be great if they wanted to do that. We would all would love that. Um, but really we want them to be informed um, and so we really kind of entered into our redesign of the lab with the idea of like, we just want informed voters out there, you know? And so like, let's, let's do what we can to kind of get the idea of science out there and not worry so much about making our non-majors class um, biology light, which is I think what, what we were doing in the past. And so um, switching to the eight week mini semester makes it more accessible. The lobster simulations have been uh, a very good at uh, giving us a platform within which then Laura has developed a series of at home sort of hands on kinds of activities that students can actually um, be introduced to experimental design and um, believe it or not we're having non major students do some baby statistics as well, which has been awesome. Great to hear. No, super helpful and that's um, I actually have the, the Q and a and I'm, I'm happy to start weaving in some of these questions. Um, we do have one question, uh, Mark and Laura, I'm going to direct this at you, but Dr. Raming, Fran, if you guys wanna step in, feel free to do so. Do you feel it's different that these are non-major students? Could majors start this way to bring more students in, but eventually gain the hands on needed for majors? Absolutely. Um, I think that this has a huge role potentially with major students as well. And um, Hannah, of course, you know this, but I'll just tell to the whole group. Uh, we started this design of non-majors biology pre-COVID, but now that we're in COVID, we reached out to you and said, we really need to think about, um, you know, what Fran said, immunology lab. Like, you know, we, we have immunology, we have cell biology. Um, and I feel that faculty members who we had been talking with for years about pedagogical uh, changes, integrating things that are more uh, hands-on, a little bit more inclusive like Labster and other things, um, they were kind of closed off to. But then COVID kind of put them in a position where it's like, we've got to do something. Um, and I think the reports we're hearing back now are that our upper level, like 400 plus labs who are using labs, and I think we have about a half a dozen who are using it, um, have been very, very positive. And I think there's a lot of faculty who are now thinking, this would be a great way of introducing this general idea before students come into the lab so that they are more um, prepared to grab the pipettes or the gel or you know whatever it is that we want them to do hands-on. Um, so, we're in the midst of a complete re, uh, redesign of our intro majors lab as well. Um, and there have been lots of conversations about how Labster may integrate into that ultimately as well. So, so to the point, yes, I, I feel like we did this redesign pre-COVID because we had an absolute need for our non-major students and we needed to update their experience. Um, but there's absolutely a role for this within the majors as well. Um, and I think it's very engaging. And I think, I think it's, it's the sort of thing where we will eventually start seeing students who are in the non-majors lab say, hey, biology is actually kind of cool, or I kind of like the chemistry side of things. Uh, and I think we will all start to pull some more students into STEM because of how engaging the simulations are. I sure hope so. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Rami, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as well, since Florida State University um, does have universal access to our lab simulations, and I'm sure using a lot of other technology alongside in the courses. Do you see technology being used equally among non-majors and major courses, or does it fall heavier in, in one direction? What's your perspective? Well, because of our gen ed requirements, both non-majors and majors would have to take those gateway courses where Labster is being used. So Gen Chem 1 and 2. Uh, general bio one and two. We have it in engineering lab and students have to take those courses. And like Mark, I'm hoping that students who did not have necessarily a well-resourced high school, but are now at Florida State, perhaps in another major, and they have these resources now. They've been exposed to a fantastic lab, gamified, storified context that they begin to see themselves 
in science. Maybe they never considered it, but they're intrigued, right? They're like, oh, they're engaged in this. Maybe I could be a chemist. Uh, Stephanie Dillon, Dr. Stephanie Dillon is presenting later for you. And she's one of our lobster stars, right? She had been using lobster for some time and she did something that's quite similar to Laura once we went remote in shipping out at home kits in conjunction with the lobster. And I don't wanna take her thunder because she's gonna be talking about that later, but definitely the exposure that students get, it's non-threatening, it's engaging. My hope is that they are going to consider, hmm, maybe I could see myself in this field. And something else that we're doing uh, to have that happen, or at least set the stage for that, is that we are using an additional Labster product, which is the Labster Direct, with our STRIDE program, which are our pre-med students. And they have an, an engagement service component of their course, where they go out into local high schools in Florida and provide STEM education. And so low resource schools are getting this world-class lab come to them. Low SES students, first gen students, black, brown, all kinds of students are therefore ex you know, exposed to what could be for them a career. Mm -hmm. And we're hoping uh, that they come to Florida State one day, better prepared to engage in this field to say, well, you know, I have use this kind of equipment before. I'm not afraid. I know what I'm doing. I'm just gonna get in there and do those labs. So for us, it's an equity issue. We're, we're moving into our communities in a Broadway high school, trying to address that pipeline issue. And then when they come here in gen ed, if, they, if they're from out of state, if they've not worked with us, then Labster is there again, something at home. They can you know, try it out. You can break something and it's not gonna cost the university any money. You can try out some of the equipment that you know you would never be able to do regularly. And maybe we get that future Nobel Prize winner that comes out of Florida State because they've had this experience. And I don't think that's a pie in the sky kind of thing. I think it's very possible. Fantastic, yeah. Building that confidence and allowing students to see that they could fit in the STEM industry, absolutely. Um, we're getting a lot of questions now, so we're going to look through these. All right, um, one question. Do you think the current situation might even widen the gap between those who get hands-on experience and those who don't? Any thoughts on that? Again, do you think the current situation might widen the gap between those who get hands-on experience and those who don't? I'm assuming being primarily learning virtually. I'm going to jump no. in on that just briefly and I'll leave it to Laura and Mark if they want to add to this. Um, I've always taken a little bit of hope that our current pilots don't jump into big jets to practice before we get in it. They use simulations every day and we trust them when we get into a plane to take us from point A to point B. And, if, and this is our life, right? We're putting our life in their hands when we sit in that seat. And so if we are willing to do that, I trust that the simulations provide an avenue for students who would not ordinarily have it. And for those that would have it because of the current context, uh, could continue their learning. The possibility that they get the hands-on experience later, I think is definite, right? Um, but what if that doesn't happen for 10 years? That means that the student shouldn't have it. I don't think it expands the gap and it only does so if students, other students who don't have the kinds of resources like Florida State um, don't get access to lobster. And that's what we're trying to address, right? By moving into our communities in a broad way. Mm -hmm. And we are sure that other institutions around the country, perhaps around the world who are using lobster could do the same thing. Like look at their schools that are around them and say, what are the service opportunities that we can engage in that brings science to first-gen students, low SES students, women, students with physical, uh, mental disabilities who want to be in science? I think the field and the platforms, the innovation has the opportunity to close some of those gaps. At least that's, that's where I stand on it. Thank you so much. 
So um, I'll, another... I'll jump in quickly, Hannah, because I think I think this actually kind of hits at a really fundamental thing that Laura and I thought deeply about as we were uh, designing this lab, which is um, how much hands-on training does a non-major student need versus how much of an introduction to the process of science and how science works is required. Um, so I, I think my answer would be very different if we're talking about majors. I think there's a huge opportunity for labs to be integrated into majors courses. I think it's safe to say that 100% of my colleagues in both of our biology departments would say, students who are majors need hands-on experience. You have to touch a pipette, you have to load a gel, extract DNA, whatever the skills are. Like you have to be able to do those things. Does a non-major student have to hold a pipette? I would argue no. I, I, I would much sooner them understand at a deeper level the competencies behind uh, how science works and why when scientists disagree with each other publicly, that that's a good thing. Um, so I think that that, that kind of gets at the this dichotomy, at least that we have at KU, between mm -hmm. majors and non-majors. And I think that that I think that speaks to the question was, we all want all of our students to have a hand-on experience. I feel like hands-on experience at the at the cost for a non-major student of not having a deeper understanding of the process, um, I'm willing to give up the hands-on in that case. And we're still are having them do things. They're generating data, they're measuring traits, they're doing statistics. It's just we're doing that in a, in a very different way than we had in the past. Thank you, that's really good insight. Um, next up, I'm going to fuse a couple questions here. They're on similar lines. Um, first is, first, students that don't like technology <laughs> and you're implementing it into the classroom, how are you getting around that? And then alongside that, um, there's a question, have any of the panelists collected student feedback about the technology they're using? If so, what do students think of this experience? Um, so a little bit of a broad question, but do students enjoy using learning technology in their science courses? I believe that they do. Um, at the University of the Bahamas, the little chat that I mentioned earlier, um, the Facebook group for all students, they do respond to all of my posts. And I think that they can appreciate the fact that they can complete a simulation at any time of day. It's usually left open for them to complete the simulation for about a period of a week or a few days. And if they decide to complete the lab at 4 a.m., they can do so. Uh, where on the other hand, if you miss your lab class at 10 a.m. or eight, worse, 8 a.m., that's it, it's over for you. So I believe that they enjoy that aspect of it, as well as it presents itself as more of a game than a class that you need to sit and listen to your lecture go on and drone on before you actually do your experiment. And I think that they like the fact that they can complete it more than once. And like I said, I think it presents itself in a very friendly manner, much like a game versus mm -hmm. the hardcore, I need to be perfect uh, manner in an actual physical lab and then they're not being viewed by their lecturer who can tend to tell them you're not holding the pipette right or I need you to stroke, uh, inoculate in this manner. So I think that they like the freedom to be more independent. So I do believe that the students actually enjoy using Lapster versus in-person class a little bit more. Right, at least supplementing it, right? I mean, yeah. if, if done correctly, it can be really powerful to use them alongside each yes. other. Um, let's see, we'll do, we'll squeeze in one more question. Um, from your experience, how can you promote teamwork and creativity through these simulations while keeping insight gender equity? So I'm curious, anyone's thoughts? Well, I think it, it's up to how the professor, the faculty member envisions their course. So if teamwork is an important component and it's objective of, of your course, especially now because we are remote, we can share screens through our Zoom, the shared lab. We have a faculty member who has a Panama City campus who just doesn't use the lab in isolation. It's a part of a broader uh, class experience. They have to complete an actual lab report. And so 
you can move outside. It's not just like, oh, you only do the lab. So we're working together as a group. We're in breakout rooms. We're working together on our lab that we need to turn in to Dr. Purdue. And so it's a bit of the creativity of the faculty member, but also to reach out to their teaching and learning centers at their institutions when they're not quite sure um, how to do that. Uh, we may not necessarily be physics and definitely not physics experts, but we can certainly help you think about how to use the technology to reach those goals that you set. So breakout rooms have been the answer to a lot of our issues um, about teamwork while we're remote. It's worked well. Um, even with our learning assistants doing um, academic support for our students in STEM. So that's certainly one avenue that, that I would toss out there for anybody um, to use the platforms, the, uh, the additional platforms um, to work in conjunction with Lobster to get where you want to get. Absolutely. Um, and, and hopefully, and I don't want to assume for you, but I would guess that you would continue those breakout sessions even in a non-remote world. So taking what we're learning these months, these semesters, and then using it to impact and, and make our teaching even better moving forward and impact more students. Um, and that's all the time we have for questions. So we're just going to have a couple housekeeping um, remarks to close up here. First, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our four panelists today. Um,